Hey, my name is Ross Marquand and I play Red Skull. You are listening to Panels to Pixels podcast. Check it out. The fulcrum is one of the most powerful tools an engineer has in his arsenal. The pressure point by which all things pivot. simple lever that can make children teeter on the brink or save them from certain death. Hey, panelists, welcome back to the show. I'm Mark. And I'm Becky. And this is Panels to Pixels podcast. And this episode... Well, we didn't get this episode recorded probably the first time because Mark was an idiot and didn't hit record on Zoom. <laughs> Anyhow, that's a funny tale that me and Becky have on our own. And I'm sure this recording is going to be a little bit different than that one. But uh, we are also late due to scheduling. And uh, I had a lot of work going on the previous week. We had this recorded at the beginning or the end of last week. But we're getting it to you now before episode seven comes up. So uh, I'm hoping to drop this right before it hits on Sunday. So hopefully you guys get this and you get to listen to it and say, all right, well, I got to listen to that. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, we are recording and we're covering episodes five and six of Snowpiercer season four. So uh, we're going to go through uh, episode four first and then. We're going to go right into uh, episode five because they kind of flow into each other. And keep in mind, everybody, yes, I always say it's a spoiler full podcast. So you had enough time right now to actually watch it. If you're current with Snowpiercer, if you're just new to the Snowpiercer series and you're listening to this as a follow along, thank you. Uh, I'm sure there's plenty of other people out there doing it. But uh, if you like to hear our take, this is our take. So that being said and done, Becky, you want to give us uh, the title and the the synopsis of episode five? Episode five is titled The Engineer. And after asking for proof of life and getting one very suspicious phone call with an unconvincing sounding baby, Leighton agrees. He convinces Ruth to connect the trains. And somehow, despite being aware that the fate of the entire New Eden population relies on this train, Ruth agrees to the terms and surrenders the engine. Wah, wah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Leighton and his uh, need to get his child back, everybody. <laughs> Putting uh, the needs of the few ahead of the needs of the many. And, uh, when we recorded this previous, I actually mentioned that now I got it right. <laughs> I was getting it all wrong. And I'm sure all the Trekkies and Trekkers out there are like, you dummy. <laughs> yeah, so anyhow, something that Spock had said to Kirk a long time ago. Anyhow, it, it's late in trying to play like kind of, and I'll mention it later on and we'll go into a little bit more. He's taking more of a dictator role in leadership into New Eden and yeah. what is more important to himself i understand that goal because he's driven because he lost the woman he loved the only thing he has left is his child that child was taken from him and now he wants to take big alice and connect it to snowpiercer i believe mm-hmm. and and go after uh you know for uh his daughter and it, it, he's not really thinking practically for the people he's just thinking for his own now Mm -hmm. it's a little bit selfish and i do understand that and don't think of me as being a dick everybody but (laughs) i i i am also thinking of the people and how they're saying hey we're building this community just like any dystopian uh show or movie where people are trying to build a new society after it fell on and had done this and this guy's just saying, no, I'm going to do what I want, even though I'm leading you. And I, and then everybody else is like, we're a democracy, not a dictatorship. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I, uh, and it's like, I put it in my notes saying Liana for big Alice. And this was hard. 
because just to see it, but those were the terms of the Admiral and uh, Leighton took it upon himself to do that. Now, mind you, there are issues regarding this and Becky, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, like uh, Big Alice, which is what they have. They have to utilize that as like a, a kind of energy source for yeah, New we, Eden. The- Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, New Eden only has, I think they had three weeks uh, once Big Alice actually left before they needed to come back. And otherwise, New Eden won't survive without them. So yeah. it was, um, it was, I agree that I think it was a little selfish of Layton to just say, hey, we're doing this and go. But um, the people got behind him. So yeah, hopefully they'll get back in time. <laughs> Was there anything uh, that you found interesting that you liked within the episode? Uh, I like that we finally got a glimpse of the silos. Um, at, when I was first watching before we got to the end, I thought it was intriguing that Layton noticed that there was only, there were 35 floors, but 10 of the buttons were missing on the elevator. Hmm. So I was kind of curious what that was about. And that that did not disappoint in the end. Um I mean, Wilford's back. Sean Bean did so good at being evil. Uh, I wrote in my notes, he is unapologetically cruel and arrogant as ever. (laughs) He always plays one of those characters. Now He does it so well. He does do it so well, and I love Sean Bean. Uh, I've loved him since Lord of the Rings. I really loved him in National Treasure because it shows his true evil ways and selfish ways. In, in the first movie, and I yep. thought I thought he played a good he t- he plays a good villain. He does a more a psychological villain at that too. But I, I just love how his emotions come out with this one. He's very pompous. He's and he's very analytical about a lot of things. So the gears are grinding in his head, just mm-hmm. like a train. Constantly. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, <laughs> And no pun he, intended. No pun. Yeah, no pun was intended. <laughs> but the uh, the funny thing is, is that he's a manipulator, an opportunist. And he's so good at it. And he's so good at it. The, the character's so good at it. And he knows what is needed for Snowpiercer and Big Alice. Mm-hmm. And he knows certain things. So we're going to get into that later on. But uh yeah he does make his appearance within this and you think oh my god i thought it was like oh my god i thought he was dead <laughs> i hoped <laughs> i mean uh, yeah, really though they can't they can't end this show without giving us a little bit more wilford so yeah it, yeah that that was the driving force for the movie the show from the very beginning but i, I love how within the first season that was like it was an ominous thing. We didn't even know he existed or was around at that time. Yeah. Now he's, and then he played a disappearing act <laughs> before this season and he comes back. So, and it, it, a much needed character to move the plot and the story along, even though it kind of is redundant, but it does work for the fact that it it's what, New Eden has to deal with and literally anything within Snowpiercer throughout the years had to deal with over and over again. It was that over looming image of Wilford and you know, the, the one person that I missed a lot, it, she does make, I think she does make an account appearance. I wasn't going through my notes again, like I should have. And I didn't really re-listen what we recorded last <laughs> about this one <laughs> we recorded, but Jennifer Connelly's character that that was the only uh, person that I was missing. And maybe it's, I wanted more of that character than anything. Yeah, I think we're going to get that coming soon. I think She'll it's, in the, soon. yeah, it was more definitely in uh, episode six. Like I said, spoilers, everybody. Yeah, we do see her more, which is pretty cool. And, uh, but this was more geared more towards Leighton and his, uh, uh, just trying to justify his needs for getting his daughter back, Leanna back. And uh, it, it, there's certain points in the, in the show. And I, I just love Davi Diggs and his representation and how he does the character uh, of him holding uh, her stuffed bunny as he had to strip and he had to like put it down before he had to get on. 
that location. Yeah. They, I forgot why it was like, it was not really meant for particularly because of like, do you have any hidden weapon weapons or anything like that? But that was hard to watch, but it, it shows how complex of a, uh, an actor that David Diggs is. Yeah. He did like a great him. job. Uh, I, I like the, the connection with Ben and Alexandra. Yeah. I just love that point. That's something I had in my notes. I really liked Ruth in this episode. Mm. I think she really stood out in both episodes, actually. But it, yes. it's so nice to see her character evolve and the growth yes. in her character. And when Wilford walked in, the absolute pure look of hatred on her face. It was like if looks <laughs> could kill, he would have dropped dead right there. And, you know, her confidence in telling um, Milius, you know, you can't trust him. And mm -hmm. I think Millie is actually more in the next episode, but I think he kind of heeds that warning a little bit, but that's another bonus to bringing Wilford back is to watch the back and forth between him and the Admiral and how it's like, seems to me like they're just a, a pissing contest. One's trying to one up the other. Yeah. And I'm very anxious to see who, if either come out on top at the end of this. Yeah. It's going to be a control battle. Who, mm -hmm. And I think Wilford being more of the cog in the machine, not to, like I said, to make a pun <laughs> or a point, but he is, and he could do that to Milius, but there's a lot of things that we don't know about Milius himself. We've said it, we said it, I think, uh, when we covered it, the, the first four episodes. And I said it that, you know, it's like he comes in and it's like there for peace. And I'm like, you're acting like a dictator, like a communist country, very militant communist country. Mm -hmm. When you come in here to take over, you're making the people on the train who are technically guests or even people from New Eden and making them work the train very much how it was in in the beginning in the very beginning of snowpiercer when ruth where you you know and this is where character development comes into play and i really do enjoy it because i i think i live to love to hate ruth in the very beginning yeah <laughs> because of how she was and then she was able to turn that around and it shows that people could change because she saw what layton was doing and what good could come about what he was presenting but now she's on the other end of the spectrum of trying to help with these people in a democratic community and he's taking the shift of dictator so mm -hmm. it's like the shoes on the other foot at this yeah. point and we've come full circle or full resolution like <laughs> snowpiercer and yes i did bring those puns back becky from when we first recorded this the i'm first not time. mad <laughs> <laughs> love a good pun yes but yeah, and uh, I, I I start to uh, I'm starting to see the uh, whole Milius and uh, Wilford like like two wrong sides of a magnets trying to come together, and there's going to be a push pull yeah. reaction at that point, and it's going to come to a halt at a certain point, maybe for the end of one, or maybe the end of for both who knows and it'll work out in the end for those in new eden and for Leighton in the Happily end Happily ever after <laughs> we'll see <laughs> yeah <laughs> but uh anything else uh ben i would i do want to talk about ben um that broke my heart i think it was I wasn't, I knew there were going to be losses this season but i was mm -hmm. not expecting ben to be one of them but I think they gave him a very heroic and beautiful end uh, when I felt I felt Till's emotions when she goes to tell Ruth what Ben is doing. And Ruth says, but we don't have any suits. And it just she realizes it. And I realized it at the same time. It's like, oh, no. And I just that he sacrificed himself, knowingly sacrificed himself to try to save these people that he's his family i just was so enduring and the cgi and the way they froze him at, at, and the tail looking at him and screaming and him just looking back at her as he's dying it just that yeah. was one of the most 
That was one of the best scenes I've ever seen on this show. It was very well done. We haven't seen a frozen uh, appendage or anything like that in a very, very long time. And it was it was hard to see, but within any dystopian kind of or apocalyptic kind of show movie, you, there's always a character that you love that is always dismissed. Or, uh, but this person, you know, Ben went out in a blaze of glory. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, this is sad because of Alex because of her relationship uh, with. No, I'm not thinking Alex. Melanie. <laughs> Melanie, that's it. I'm keep. Um, yeah, I shouldn't confuse mother and daughter. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, she's she doesn't know this is happening, but mm-hmm. he chose it and took it upon himself. And it, it was sad to see him go, but it, it was it was for the better good of yeah. of everybody at that point. And uh, yeah, it, it was hard. But well, yeah, the last thing. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, you got. Uh, last thing I will say about this episode is um, they do great with the music in all of the episodes, but I think the score in this one, with every scene, the suspenseful, the dramatic, the heartbreaking, I think they did a phenomenal job, and it really added to the awesomeness of the episode for lack of a better word yeah it, it, with any movie or tv show you get that great composition that goes along with it that echoes through that adds to the character of the scene and you know if they ever had something where you just see the scene without it it'd be nice just to see what the difference is you know, if they had something like behind the scenes or you know, with, with certain Blu-rays and DVDs and stuff back in the day, they would do something like that. It was like, here, just the score. Here, it's just the dialogue. And then you're like, oh, wow, it does add. That's like putting out there, you know, if you ever watch Jaws without John Williams' score, you know what it would sound like? Uh, waves. And you wouldn't be scared because that was part, that was a character. That is true. Yeah. The, when you the heard that. The movie itself. Yeah. That, that's true. So uh, I'm not sure entirely who did the score. I try to look real quick, but honestly, it does very well for the, the show and it adds mm-hmm. to it and it, it makes you it, it kind of engages you into the scene. But um, what was that? Oh, I have a little note in here. And that is. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I have here Leighton is yet again taken to the Admiral, who does kind of hold up to his end of the deal and shows mm. Leighton his daughter. But before that, all he had was like baby sounds coming through, and he didn't know if it was his kid or not. <laughs> so I like, think he wanted, with all of his heart and soul, to believe that that was his baby. Yeah. Even though the rest of us were like, mm, I don't know if that risk the lives of all these people for that but you do what you got to do yeah but he was also uh, the she was held in uh being held in wilford's arms as crying. He's, as wilford smiling like a jerk and yeah, that we, was yeah and we find out where josie is uh and she is being experimented on by dr headwood who is Not taking Stan josie's headwood. blood and and seemingly uh putting it on Wilford, like why he was doing it. Yeah, that that was an interesting that that scene brought up a lot of questions. And I'm very curious to see what how that plays out. Yeah. And what that is referring. And it makes me think because we like we I don't have it in my notes and I didn't rev up to it like I did when we first recorded this. Literally, because we've seen it before in the show past where uh, Wilford had on Big Alice when he finally met up with Snowpiercer, he had all these guys that would be able to sustain the extreme cold outside of Big Alice and Snowpiercer. They could sustain themselves. They wouldn't die. They wouldn't freeze. And, and it's like, all right, are th- these blood experiments, are these the same that came up with these kind of mutants? And I'm, is Wilford trying to play, I want to be this uh, ice mutant? 
Well, yeah, for- it's like, is he getting Josie's blood? Is Josie, is just Josie getting his blood? Yeah. What is what is going on, and what have they done to her? We don't, I, we don't, we don't know at this point exactly what all they're they they're experimenting on, and it it just br- that brought up a lot more questions than answers for me, and I'm very interested to see how that that goes. Same here, uh, and plus we all know because we've seen it in New Eden where you you could be outside they have it's not below freezing and it, it's it's you're able to survive in it now it is cold they, you, yeah. they're all wearing everything it's not 70 degrees it's not 60 degrees it's probably within 30s to 40s but tolerable and uh, people are able to live that even inside and inside they could heat and that was the whole point of big alice that's the yeah. reason why they wouldn't be able to survive because it's providing energy and heat for them to live on. But if they have a cold front and if the, the winds change in a certain way and they do get a deep, they could at least take shelter inside. And I, I think that's why the big concern of like, why are you taking Beg Alice? If you take it away, we have to wait for this whole resolution for you to come back. Yeah, And that could take X amount of time because it's going around. And as we all know, these trains go on a track that goes around a certain designation point. Uh, I don't, I don't remember or recall. I think it is the world. Yeah. Oh yeah. They cover the entire, yeah. Entire world. The way Wilford builds it. Yeah. So, and it has, and it goes phenomenal speeds, everybody. Anyhow, uh, those are my notes for this particular episode. Do you have anything further? Do you have any quotes for this one? Uh, I have one, and that's Ben to the Admiral, and he goes, you think love is weakness, is a weakness. And the Admiral says, yes, I do. And then, Ben, obviously, you have never been in love. And the Admiral goes, of course I have. How do you think I learned that lesson? Yeah, it's good. Yeah. It's, it gives you a little bit of insight, to insight who into him and yeah. why he is the way he is, because he's obviously been burned. It's like, who hurt you? Yeah, literally, that's <laughs> that's what it is. It's one of those people who became bitter, and then they just take it out on others. Yeah. Did you have one? I have a few. Uh, they're short, but uh, when Leighton was in the elevator asking the guards the questions, and they weren't responding, and they're getting off the elevator, and he says, good talk. Um, when Wilford sees them for the first time, and he just gives that Wilford smile and says, welcome home. And then Till tells him to go to hell. And he says, I did. Wasn't much fun. And the <laughs> last one, it just got my heart when uh, Ruth told uh, Ben and Till when she was going to stay behind to save Leighton, go to New Eden, have a pint. First one's on me. <laughs> I like that. That's that was, sweet. That is good. I only have one left, and that's Leighton to the Admiral. And he goes, where's your backup? And the Admiral goes, I don't need backup when I when you have leverage. And literally, I think that was right around the time when Wolford came out. And that was like, <laughs> but, you know, honestly, we're going to get a, a bunch of poker between uh, the Admiral and Wolford at this point. <laughs> yeah, a lot. But yeah. Uh, that's all I had for episode five. I guess we could move on to episode six. Yeah. All right. Well, episode six is entitled Bell the Cat. And the synopsis is Nima needs more samples for his experiments. So Milius sends Wilford and the soldiers to collect privately. Milius tells Wolf to kill Wilford. Leighton wakes up on an abandoned floor and is approached by humans with toxic gas scars. This was an action-packed episode. Yes. Um, I love the way it started with um, us getting to see what happened to Wilford during that 11 months that he was gone from Snowpiercer. That was a, that was a great start to the episode. Mm-hmm. I think uh, when Leighton woke up and all of that started happening, I legit thought he was in a dream because mm-hmm. I 
I was confused. I did not understand these people. It's like, is this zombies? <laughs> no, no. It I was, was very confused. It takes us it back. Now. Yeah, it literally takes us back to that one person that we see when they attacked um, that one, one of the admiral's men, and the they're cut, but you see this gas coming out mm-hmm. of them. So it, it leads us to believe there was more experimentation. How did these guys survive? This this is still a bit of a mystery of what's going on, and it makes me think of are there na- are their days numbered as a group because of these experimentations, and why would they need the train? Is there something within the train that they need to continue to live? and they have to be on it for full resolutions we don't know and uh how does this affect the other people because if what if they come into contact with them so yeah, yeah. so it, it to me it's just like hmm there's something else going on here but we're not being told the admiral's not being very open but then again he's also playing a battle you know a, a game of poker with wilford and a little bit with Leighton, and then you get wilford in the mix being a jerk yeah <laughs> <laughs> wilford's gonna wilford what i did like is that uh wilford actually knew more areas of the trains than anybody else like a hidden section that he could yeah. go to, which I found interesting, but that is what he had in his back pocket because he built these trains. And Melanie knows a lot about these trains too. And I wouldn't put it past that she knows it or she knows of like a mysterious door to go to or go through. And uh, and I'm sure there's a way for even Wolfrey to put a cog in the machine for the Admiral to stop. And then once he finds his weakness and I'm I'm wondering and thinking and I'm always like this where it's like that whole gas that comes out of them. But you said, like you mentioned before, you have these people that Leighton winds up getting stuck with and they look like zombies, but they also look like they were prisoners. Mm -hmm. And they also reminded me of what. In the very beginning of Snowpiercer, when you had the upper class in their higher end train car, and then you had the tailies in the back that did all the work and had to struggle and look dirty, depressed, grimy. It looked like maybe these people were thrown back because they couldn't hold up their end or they couldn't keep up with the tasks that were needed to get the train to keep going. But and also, I, like you, I, I was looking at them when they were looking at him at, at late and going, are they going to eat him? Right. <laughs> so they have to be hungry. And that was a pretty cruel thing that they do when the soldiers, when the Admiral sent Wilford with them to go get more samples and they just throw out the the food. That It's like a game to them that these mm. people's, obviously these people's lives don't matter. And then Nima confessing to Alex that there was a an issue with the experiments and they they were on the wrong end of it. And but yeah, it's it's why why are they still there? Why why have haven't they just killed them all? So I guess they are still useful in some way. They are, yeah. Uh, it, like, well, I hate saying it, and it's I have to refer to The Walking Dead when Negan says it. People are a resource. Yeah, they're, they're utilized, you know, the for whatever skills they have or whatever need they need for like uh, physical work. So I think that's the reason behind it. I don't think it's for them to be eaten. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we haven't gotten resorted not. cannibalism but if you Is all it- recall the movie they talked about cannibalism in the movie but i i look at the movie now in comparison to the show as two different entities even though somebody was telling me uh i think when we did the movie we thought and when the mo- when the show came out that this was years and years ahead but in perspective now i'm thinking of it as two different worlds this is this yeah. version and this is that version or you have the comic book version that's out there <laughs> too so if a lot of you i've only read the first graphic novel which i own and it's out there everybody you can find it on amazon it's a french book so 
be careful which one you get. So if you're American, British, or whatever, and you want to read the English version of it, they do have an English transcript version of it, but they also have a French version. So if you're Canadian or French, you could easily <laughs> <laughs> read it as well. I'm sure the translation would probably be right. And then our I version so. would be a little bit different because <laughs> anytime that's like watching subtitles, like I do on a Godzilla film and you, you watch subtitles as you listen to the dubbed version in English and you're like, wait a minute, the story doesn't really, okay. <laughs> that dialogue doesn't seem the same. Something's not right here. Something's not right, but you get the best of both worlds. If you're able to know both. Yeah. Anyhow, um, there's something uh, that I, I picked out on in this, which was the Admiral is here for uh, to uh, like when he greets Wilford when he awakens and he and that was in that flashback and he believes they can work together for the good of the future. But however, as we know, Wilford doesn't play nice with others and he has his own agenda and we all know mm-hmm. this and that's where we're at now currently. But I I really did enjoy the fact that we got to see what happened 11 months previous where he got picked up because he was out in the world. I think that was important. Yeah, it is. You need that kind of backstory. Sometimes you just leave it to the, uh, your, your own thoughts. It's like, Oh yeah, he's back. Well, and they'll use like two pieces of dialogue to explain it. And then it just never is brought up again. At least with this, you get to see something. Yeah. Out of it, you know, I think that, that we really needed that to move that story along. And I also uh, thought it was interesting how, con- well, I don't, don't want to say kind, but I don't know if it was um, a purpose. I don't think the Admiral does anything without intent, but how flattering he was to Wilford. And how impressed he says he was with the train. And I think we can do great work together. And it's like, does, does he believe that? And then he changes his mind as he go, as they go on and he sees that Wilford's basically full of crap or um, did he know what he was dealing with ahead of time, either be it from stories from Melanie, other people. And he was just feeding him what he thinks Wilford needed to hear. So he would be complacent. Yeah, and well, or maybe he already knew that he was a con artist, and he was waiting for him to drop a bad hand in his poker play. Yeah, you know that's that's one of the things he he the admiral has a need for him for a reason, and it's because he was the creator of the train, and he knows that Wolfers probably holding out. So, but he also has to deal with his devious tactics. So he's. It's kind of like uh, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer mm-hmm. uh, routine. So uh, I think that's where it lies. Um, I have something in here. Wilford manages to use his charisma to rouse the troops in the canteen. But as he starts breaking the rules, smoking his cigar, the Admiral shows up and lays down the law. He's like, like it's a military thing. There's no, hey, having fun and whatnot. And he takes Wilford's cigar and makes one of the other guys, the soldiers, hold out his hand while he burns it with the cigar. Yeah. That- and, yeah. And when all the soldiers head back to their stations, the Admiral makes the example, an example of Wilford and forces him to head down to the sub levels on a sample run with the troops. And Which he, he does not expect Wilford to return. Exactly. That was the whole point. He's waiting for either one of his men to do something sloppy and do something wrong. But he also, you're also sending Wilford somewhere else that Wilford knows. So he knows this train. Yeah. So, and he, he knows certain things about where they're at. They're in a silo. Oh, that's right. On the lower floors. But it's it's obvious. He does know something, something because he knew where to go to the, to get to the communication room. Um, it's like, a, so yeah, he's got knowledge and he knows about the elevators. He's either paid attention or he's built relationships with guards and they've, you know, given him information. He's, he's got a lot more knowledge than or, I would think he would have. Or a theory in my head, now that I think about it, because I was thinking of the train, and I'm 
I, I was a meaning silo because I, my memory sucks. And obviously <laughs> I didn't put it in here. What if Wilford actually built those silos? Well, I thought about that, that he was involved, but when he, when uh, he meets the Admiral, the Admiral says, mm-hmm. um, well, you know, he says, where are we? And Wilford or the Admiral tells Wilford we're in, uh, was it Djibouti? Yes. So I, it wouldn't surprise me if Wilford was behind every aspect of this uh, save the world yeah. situation. So yeah. yeah, it's a, it's a good possibility. Yeah. It's like when it's like they were at towards that end, even though he was building snow piercer and eventually big Alice too, he was probably involved with the, the setup because he's a master builder, you know, not in Lego everybody. But, <laughs> that's, I want to have that song stuck in my hand. Everything is awesome. I know. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I, I put <laughs> an ear welcome. earworm in her head. <laughs> everybody. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was a big setup for him, I think, as well to send him to the dungeons and never to come back. <laughs> yeah, and then he did, or when he heard him over the intercom. You could tell right then and there Wolf was in trouble. And I thought it was telling or interesting that they can live without their helmets on. Yes. Yeah. It kind of, oh man, uh, this, uh, <laughs> I, I just get thoughts in my head because I'm like, just, a, I'm a movie file. I'm a, a fan of movies and horror movies and stuff like that. I don't know if you ever saw a planet Terra. Mm-mm. It was a grindhouse film. They had that with uh, Death Proof. It was a Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez combination. Ooh. And it was meant to be old grindhouse style movies. So Death Proof was uh, Kurt Russell, just to breeze over everybody. And I know you're going to be bored and snoring. Uh, it, uh, we will be covering those on Adrenaline Cinema. I've been wanting to do those. But Death Proof was a stuntman who's crazy and attacks people with his car or puts them in his Death Proof car and winds up but the last part of death, like like seventy five percent of it, is him chasing down somebody in old uh, these girls that are part of a movie crew, and uh, they get into like a whole. It's the biggest chase and everything. But Planet Terror, which was uh, also attached to that, if you do the double feature, Bruce Willis is in that with a bunch of crew, including Quentin Tarantino, and they uh, they have to wear masks because they got gassed. So they can't survive without their masks for too long because they'll mutate. Hmm. So it made me think of that. It's like, oh, they could they could survive without their helmets for a while. But maybe that is what the helmets are doing. They're supplying them with the gas at some point to give them breathable sustenance so they could take their helmet off and be yeah. in, in the real world. But we won't know until we get to that point, everybody. We haven't seen evidence of what these experimentations are, especially the fact that we got the doctor in Alex nosebleeds and he needs to check her. And there's like question because she was the only one that was, uh, I think it's one of the few people he ever met that was outside. Mm -hmm. And And it's, yeah, and she and since she's viable for both Snowpiercer and Big Alice, he needs that and he needs her alive. Yeah. I think that was one of the reasons that Will uh Admiral was so blase about letting Wilford go is he realized what he had with Alex and how smart she is and she basically learned everything Wilf- Wilford knows. Yes. Yeah, uh, literally she knew she well, her mother helped create it with uh, Snowpiercer. Uh, Melanie knows the inside and out, but also Alex knew all that information as a child, and then she was stuck with Wilford throughout that time on Big Alice, and knows his mind and learns directly from the man. So she kn- probably knows all his tricks. Mm-hmm. But I, from what I could tell, with the doctor in a way, Milius thinks of her as is like pretty much the future. Yeah. This is the future of how people will survive, but 
they're concerned about whether or not she will survive due to this because uh, maybe it's different atmospheres of her being in the train so long after she was exposed and then dealing with that is he thinking oh we're gonna have to put her on the gas to sustain her life or is that are they gonna examine her to find a way to cure themselves i think it's because he mentioned nima mentioned whatever that rocket was that they they used you know, blew up that created yeah. New Edens. It released something in the air, and that's what's causing the reaction that's giving the nosebleeds. And for yes. them to have her to be able to test because she was actually there in New Eden is a big deal. And exposed. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh we'll see. I- I had like a weird thing when I when I had these notes put in too, which is so funny. It's like uh, the reason why they kept Alex on there. I said, like I said, they think of her as being the future. If Leighton and Mel- Melanie don't make it, God forbid, in the show at the end, Alex can basically survive and raise Leighton's daughter, Leanna. Yeah. <laughs> and it could be a that wonderful ending that you get out of these apocalyptic or dystopian style uh shows and movies that you get out there so there's like proof of hope you know but that would be i would be okay with that i would be fine with that too but for now speculation thoughts are weird um ideas and how it would be written but we won't know until we see the next uh bunch of episodes i do want to touch on uh going back to new eden mm-hmm. and lol at the oz and stew scene <laughs> um, wasn't expecting that. Yeah. That it seemed out of place, but uh I do like that they finally are giving Oz a solid storyline and giving him something to do other than just being the weird guy up in the hills who talks to himself. Um <laughs> I was I was very glad to see him use his smarts to figure out what was really going on. He is useful. He is smart. And it was part of what I didn't like is that they made him look like the crazy person of the town. And now now he's able to uh, redeem himself in some way and show. So some credibility within the community, I think. And I just fairness, I do give him. I'm glad they didn't carry on too long with it, but I I do understand. I or I don't. I've never been in an apocalypse, but <laughs> um, <Neither have> I. <laughs> <laughs> but that you know, I can't imagine going through something like that, dealing with that life on the train, and then here you are because his he only felt useful on that train, and when he left his his uh, wife who ended up choking on the eyeball um you know he i understand not being a hundred percent right so i don't blame him for taking some time to booze it up and <laughs> talk to himself for a little bit yeah. Good pep talk yeah and plus he needs that alone time as well we all do <laughs> yeah so so true but as long as he didn't really talk to himself in different voices, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that's wrong? <laughs> oh, man, I've been doing it wrong all this time. Oh, Darn no. it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh. So there, there's one thing uh, that I have written down here. Uh, uh, when Leighton beats uh, Wilford. Yes, that was a and, good scene. Yeah, he ha- Wilford has a knife and he stabs him or the guy and ma- and managing to break free and race away and with wolford gone Leighton's cut is a nasty one and is perceived and the perceived leader of this like really weird ragtag group carrie has just the injection needed to patch him up at that point well i think that those a lot of those people were scientists yeah which yeah, and it was wild to have that happen. Yeah. And I was like, okay, so he doesn't die or doesn't lose an appendage. Not <laughs> yet. <laughs> uh, I liked how Wilford called uh, late now, basically telling him 
you're no better than me. Yep. You're as selfish as as I am. Look what you're doing. Look what you're doing now. I think it was a it was something Leighton needed to hear and hearing it from Wilford added to I think the harshness of Leighton hearing that and being like, oh crap. Because he's right. <laughs> yeah, he is right. Uh, I just love that, uh, you know, it's Daniel Craig, right? Craig Daniels. I always get the name wrong. Wilfer? No, I'm talking Milius. Oh, uh, I think it's Craig Daniel. Craig Daniels. Because Daniel Craig is James, uh, James Bond, Bond, didn't he? Yeah. See, dyslexia or bad memory. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I do think backwards, everybody. It's it's kind of hard when, especially with numbers. But it's really weird when I do actually do remember something that's very complex and it just blows people's mind. And then they're like, but you just said that backwards. I was like, yeah, well, I got it right. That's cool. <laughs> Sometimes I do. But anyhow, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just like that for the fact it's like, yeah, it, Milius is just as bad as Wolford. But mm-hmm. they they both know it, and it's 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 just two of them like two rams butting each other's horns and heads at times, but waiting for one to break. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what was I thinking? Uh, oh, the the group. The peacekeeping lab back in the day. Yeah, that's what it was. Their task was to try to reverse the effects of CW7, but there was a chemical leak, hence their burns. Yeah. That's why they looked the way they did. So just to give you a little information. So if you it just went past you while you were watching to give you an idea. Uh they've been down there for three years and they haven't found a way to get out. So in fact, they they've resigned to their fate and pretty much uh given up. With samples yeah. just part and parcel of their daily life. So that it they they look kind of like the people who are homeless out there in the world, but they still have their purpose in some way. But now they're hopefully they're, there's gonna be hope for them. I hope so. I liked um Till and Ruth, they're seen in the tub. I thought that was a really good setting hmm. um and I, I i like that too i like those two as a as a duo i think they they work well together and i think it was a really beautiful moment when ruth gave her speech and they all carved the bee into the wood and in the, in the engine so ben would always be with them always be there yeah it, it it was very much needed and to show that never forget, you know. Um, trying to remember and trying to see if that, I have like anything that you didn't really mention yet, but I don't have anything in my notes regarding that. <laughs> I have a, a couple of things. I think the look on Nima's face when uh, Milius told him that Melanie was coming back. <laughs> he looked afraid oh, and yeah. I really want to see, is he afraid of what she found or is he afraid of her finding out all the horrible stuff that he's contributed to while she's been gone? I'm very curious about that. Yeah. Because a lot of it is like people taken and used and then they feel guilty and it's really sad because they have to do that to survive at times. So, uh, but I like the fact that you know Oz was able to make it back to New Eden, and then he has to break the news to the council regarding everything. Yeah, I I don't I can't I can't make sense of the bombs. I don't I don't know why. Why would they bomb something that they created? Could- yeah, it, it, it's just a weird, it, the whole place is rigged to blow. Yeah. And why destroy a community that was, that worked so hard? And even if so, what where are you going to find that again? 
are you just going to jump back on a train and find somewhere else that has this kind of temperature to live out and create? Yeah, it's like you're you stole these trains and wired them to go release these rockets to create these pockets that people can live in. Well, here's proof that it works and Why? success. Because, Why? Because would you, you want to have it, it for yourself. Is that what it is? I that's the only only thing I could think of. I don't. It doesn't. The bombs don't make sense, and I hope they. It's like just a ch- doing it for shock value or whatever. I hope there's something like a deterrent suspension of disbelief can only go so far. Yeah, it's like a deterrent for them. So that way it's like, oh, well, if you do this, we're going to blow it. Now that makes that uh, that that I could make sense of. So but but it, it doesn't make sense. But it's also like a childlike behavior. It's like, well, if you can't have it, if I can't have it, you can't have it. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's like very childlike in nature, but there's got to be some sort of logical ruse to their plot or their uh, their plan to do this. Or they could be they could be dummies. Yeah, it could be a like I said, just to be a way to state uh, to try to hold them at bay to control them. Keep them in line. Keep them in That's line. That's possible. You know, that that would make more sense to me than them wanting to actually bury that whole town. I can't. I, I don't see the sense in destroying that town when yeah. it, you know, it was created. It was started. And what? Oh, hold on. You if you can't if I can't have it, you can't have it. No. <laughs> it's like, what are you? Eight. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sometimes they act like it. Yeah, they do. Uh, sometimes. Yeah. I'm growing up and I act like a child, but this is crazy. (laughs) (laughs) um, I think the last point that I have is I am very excited about the showdown between Wilford, Milius, and Layton. Mm -hmm. Um, I am over the Liana plot that's, what's keeping Wilford alive. I think I said last time that he's got nine lives. Um, and I'm very interested to see how they wrap all this up. And like you said, I hope we get a satisfactory ending. Cause I think, uh, those that have stuck with the show have earned it. Yep. Same here. Uh, and that includes, you know, the, the, the actors, the characters, everything, you know, I just love them. And everybody who's been there from day one that watched, it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Glad that you guys, at least we we got this, a final season. Just think if yeah. they just ended it the way they did and it never got picked up. It would have been such a sad loss. But when we found out, we were like, yes, it's coming back and it's awesome. And at least they gave us uh, like a nice send off at least. Yeah. But and they're doing a great just, job. Oh, I think yeah. these last two episodes we're the best of the season. And that makes, that gives me hope that the next, what four will be of the same caliber. Cause these two, I really, really enjoyed both of these. Yeah. Same here. Hey, that's uh, all I've got. That's all I got too. Um, do you have any quotes? I have one quote. Mm-hmm. Uh, when Layton, the, Elevator doors closed and Wilford's still alive. Wolf didn't shoot him. And Layton just says to him, you should have taken the bullet and then charges him. I thought that was pretty badass. Awesome. That's uh, it. Well, the only one that I have would be Wilford. And it's very and pretty much very much in the very beginning, like the announcement. And it's probably going to be the intro to the podcast, everybody. Wilfred stating, the fulcrum is one of the most powerful tools an engineer has in his arsenal, the pressure point by which all things pivot. A simple lever can make children teeter on the brink or save them from certain death with a proper fulcrum. Mountains can be moved and tides can be turned. Hearts and minds can be manipulated. Now, with that and what he's done within this episode with him playing with the wires, things of that nature, knowing certain areas of the 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 trains, Snowpiercer and Big Alice. 
there's something up his sleeve to take over that they don't know. Oh, yeah. And I'm looking forward to see that. But the fact that the way it says, with a proper fulcrum, mountains can be moved and tides can be turned. Is that the bombs? That's that's a that possibly could be it. Because have they ever found water? Have they ever found water at this point? So that that's just my thoughts on that. But I just like that quote in the very beginning. It is a good quote. I'm glad you uh, read that one. It was after I googled fulcrum. It made perfect sense. All right. I think we just about covered both these episodes. And like I said earlier, listeners, I'm sorry that this came out a little later than I thought. I was going to hope it was going to be sooner and we did record it, but we just couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, There was uh, some recording techni- uh, technical issues that I created, so <laughs> it's all on me. Sorry about <laughs> that, but it won't happen again. Trust me. Hopefully. <laughs> We're all uh, covered now. Yeah, we're all covered now. But anyhow, uh, with that, we'll move right along into feedback and how you could send it. Obviously, we didn't get any feedback, but we do appreciate it when you can. Please do. The best way to do that would be go to our our Facebook group, which would be facebook.com slash panels to pixels. And there I generally and I have put in images of the episodes that we were doing and saying, leave your thoughts and about the episode in the comments below. So literally just, you know, follow us, uh, subscribe and do all that good stuff. And then just follow those images and do that. Since it goes on, in, uh, on Facebook, it also goes on Instagram. So we can be found at panels to pixels podcast on Instagram. So check that out. Uh, it's the same post and everything else so do the same and i'll get that information just the same if you feel you need to email us uh all you have to do is uh email us at panels to pixels one at gmail.com uh regular written out email will be greatly appreciated uh or you could just record yourself we have all these cool nifty devices. A lot of people have hands uh, uh, of ways of doing Zoom and everything else. You can record yourself and just send it as an attachment and we'll play it. It would be as if you were on the podcast itself and we'll actually be able to comment along after we played it. Uh, it's pretty cool when people do that and I do enjoy yeah. it. Uh, that, Like I said, panels to pixels one at gmail.com. That's panels to is spelled out T-O pixels and the number one at gmail.com. And uh, we could also be found on YouTube. So a lot of people like the idea of, you know, we've done a few videos. We've done it for Deadpool Wolverine. When you saw me, Rob, Frank, uh, cover our our thoughts on Deadpool Wolverine literally within days after it came out. And that was fun to do. My interview with Kevin Smith, that Kevin Smith who did Clerks and is having a new movie just for a cheap plug for him. Uh, the 430 movie was already premiered last week, and uh, that was pretty cool. Uh, I didn't get a chance to go, but I intend on actually going seeing that sometime soon uh, when I can. So uh, give uh, Kevin Smith some support to that. We've also had the comic book men. We had Ming Chen and Michael Zapsik from comic book men. Uh, I've also had uh, um, Veronica. The, the lady who played Veronica from Clerks on here as well on this channel That's when we cool. interviewed her. Uh, I always try to get some sort of celebrity guest when I can. It's nice when I can. Uh, we, yeah, As you heard before in previous older podcasts, my intro was Ross Marquand himself introducing, saying he played Red Skull in The Voice. So um, I'm hoping to try to get Ross back. It's kind of hard. He's a very busy man now. <laughs> but uh we all loved him in walking dead but he also voices he does a lot of stuff uh, he did ultron in the what if series for disney plus he did the red skull in endgame as well in any other variant forms and cartoons so oh and he's also in another cool robert kirkman thing that's out there invincible so check that out 
Anyhow, that's what we have there on YouTube. So uh, if you subscribe to YouTube, you could listen to the podcast that way because YouTube podcasts, we have the videos. We also do. Uh, I also put it up as a regular po- like video with the static image behind it. And you could hear it. Some people just play it on their YouTube. I've been to people's houses where they played it for me. Oh, that's <laughs> and I, awesome. And I've heard my own voice going, why am I hearing myself? Am I... <laughs> listening to my podcast in my head like it's it's so, not the voices have had they've taken over so i had a client actually had that playing and she was trying to make me laugh that's cool that's <laughs> but, really cool but with youtube uh please you know hit the subscribe button ring the bell to get notified uh give us a thumbs up if you like it leave comments because you could easily leave comments and i could take those comments as well and talk about that in the comment thread or when we talk about feedback uh if there's a rating or review because we could be found on spotify and apple Podcasts, it'd be greatly appreciated if you could give us five stars leave a comment too because that's perfect because it shows up right away and a lot of people use that as a way to do that um also keep in mind (laughs) with youtube please do not get us confused with panels to pixels we are known as panels to pixels podcast now I love Josh. I love his accent. He's a really handsome dude. And he's very bright. And I love what he brings to the table with his uh, his uh, media content. So uh, give him a listen, too. I highly recommend it as well. But, uh, yeah, look for us as panels. The Pixels podcast. If you want to see see or hear Josh, go to panels to pixels on YouTube. Just to clarify that, you know, clarify that so that way people know. <laughs> but um, other than that, uh, where else can listener hear you, Becky? Wherever you'll have me. <laughs> um, and uh, once they're taking a break to, I think Penny's doing her Lord of the Rings. Uh, but I will be appearing at some point on Still Slang, okay. Buffyverse podcast. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think with Adrenaline Cinema, we're going to be doing a, a rant on the Mayfair Witches. Yep. Season one of Mayfair Witches. So that'll be coming soon too, everybody. So if you're not listening to us there and you want to hear it, just you know, subscribe to Adrenaline Cinema Podcast. It's my other podcast. It's uh, cool. I'm trying to work out everything so both podcasts can be found on the Pyrocore Entertainment website, but uh, that might take a little time. Everybody, it's been hard. I've been dealing with a lot of work-related issues and stuff like that, but I'm trying to get these podcasts out to you, which is awesome. And I love that. And I love doing that. Anyhow, like I said before, and I have always said it, I can be heard here right on Panels to Pixels podcast, as always. Adrenaline Cinema podcast as well. And there, if you're not familiar with it, we cover action movies, TV shows like that, adventure movies, suspense and thriller movies, fantasy, anything that makes your adrenaline going. Uh, we are going to do Mayfair, which is like I said, a season one review. And then hopefully we could go on to season two episodically just for fun. And, uh, a lot of us are there that are not liking the show and I have not read the books, but we'll have Billy there to, uh, tell us the difference. And Laura, and, and Laura's Laura as well. Too, yeah. Yeah. I'm hoping eventually with this particular podcast here on panels to cover the new version of the crow when I get a chance to see that. So uh, I'm probably going to be waiting on streaming services because it's been getting really bad reviews, but I've heard a lot of good feedback from people who've gone to it and liked it and don't associate it with the first or the original movie with Brandon Lee. Um, You could also hear me on when it does show up formally fantasy picks movie edition. It's called Phil. uh, We're, it's going to be called film tropolis. So that will be Rob Moda's podcast that you can find on pyrocoreentertainment.com. So follow that and we'll notify you when the new episode is up and we'll go from there. Uh, next week here on Panels the pixels podcast, not only are we still covering the umbrella Academy, the final season, Steve and I uh, will be covering the next episode of snow piercer season four. Episode 7 called A Mouth to a Flame. So check that out when we do that. Uh, Look for the notifications on Facebook, Instagram, all that good stuff. Send in your feedback. With that, I just want to thank 
everyone for listening. I'm Mark. And I'm Becky. Same podcast, different panel, different pixel. This was Panels to Pixels podcast, everybody. And we'll see you on the next panel. Good night. Good night.